Hi, I'm David Cognetti from Thomas Jefferson University. I'm here with Melissa Pinnanen from the University of Michigan and Boyd Gillespie from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Today we're going to be discussing the mini seminar, uh, Clinical Practice Guideline, the Evaluation of the Neck Mass in an Adult. So welcome, Melissa. Welcome, Boyd. This is certainly a timely interview. We just had a, a wonderful mini seminar. And this month, in the White Journal, the Clinical Practice Guideline will be published. So hot off the press. Uh, but this is also a timely topic. So can one of you explain to me why you would consider this topic, the neck mass, timely for the audience? Now is a good time for this topic um, because the epidemiology of head and neck cancer has changed. In the last many years, uh, human papillomavirus has been responsible for many more cases of oropharyngeal cancer, which metastasized to the neck. Um, and it's changed the way we need to think about um, a patient with a lump in the neck. Uh, Melissa, you're a rhinologist. Boyd and I are head and neck surgeons. Uh, I'm sure we all have our opinions and stories about management and sometimes, unfortunately, mismanagement of head ne or neck masses. Who's the target audience here? That's a great question. So we wrote this guideline so that it would be appropriate for anybody who might be the first clinician to encounter a patient with a lump in the neck. So the, um, the authors of the guideline represented all of those practice groups. So we not only had patients on the guideline writing group, um, but nurses, primary care providers, emergency medicine physicians, um, as well as head and neck surgeons, radiologists, oral maxillofacial surgeons, pathologists. We really wanted to design this guideline to be a, a user-friendly document that um, you know, primary care doctors, ER doctors, dentists could use when encountering a patient with a neck mass. And the reason is we really want to cut down on inappropriate care that won't benefit a patient, but more importantly, uh, promote quality care and early diagnosis. Uh, as you know, earlier diagnosis with a uh, cancer can affect uh, patient survival and outcome. It's, it's a tremendous document, uh, and I, I'm looking forward for the audience to see it. It's over 30 pages. Uh, the background that went into it, I, I, I can only imagine the amount of work went, that went into it. Uh, I think over 50 randomized trials were reviewed. And I was surprised with the breadth of the document in terms of not only does it include recommendations, but it has information in there for patients. It has uh, pictorials on how to do physical examination, et cetera. Uh, so can you give me a little bit more background of how it was designed and how those, this diverse group of people that were invited to participate were selected? Um, well, the document, the contents of the document uh, were developed over the course of discussions among our group. Um, and it really reflected what the members of the group felt would be necessary for them to implement this guideline in practice. So, for example, we thought about the fact that if a primary care doctor is seeing a patient and explains to the patient that the lump in the neck might be cancer, that's a difficult conversation. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we provided the supporting materials to help with that conversation. So that's where the uh, interest in a lot of the patient education materials came from. It's really a complex endeavor that uh, our academy supports, and we wanted to make sure all stakeholders were represented. Those would be the um, clinicians who would be the first to see, often see these patients, uh, emergency medicine doctors, primary care, advanced care providers, but also uh, people who are important in the diagnosis and management of the neck mass, including radiologists, pathologists, uh, oral surgeons, and dentists. So uh, it was a very diverse group, uh, including a patient uh, representative uh, that all had a say in uh, pr prioritizing what was going into this document. As it was developed, was there disagreement along the way, mostly agreement, and how did they get sorted out? I'm sure we had some disagreement. I mean, uh, the nice thing about doing this in a very systematic manner is that you let the evidence speak for itself. And so we all come in with our own uh, inherent biases from our own training and background, but as a group, when we look at the evidence together, it's often... Um, fairly uh, straightforward making the decisions that's supported by the evidence. Great. So speaking of the evidence and decisions supported by it, why don't we name some of the top recommendations from the clinical practice guideline that, that you'd like to emphasize to the audience? 
So the first action statement um, is designed to uh, minimize inappropriate use of antibiotics. So the first uh, statement um, is that unless a patient has signs or symptoms of infection, um, that patient should not be treated with antibiotics. Okay. And how was that received by the primary care physicians on the group? Was there, was there any uh, debate or discussion or feedback? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. You know, there were some interesting discussions with the primary care providers. Um, and I think this is, um, there were some interesting discussions with the primary care providers in that it helped us realize that many of the um, clinical decisions we make as otolaryngologists that we um, simply do as a matter of clinical gestalt, um, they don't share that same gestalt. So the fact that a painless lump in the neck is more worrisome to us was, I think, information to the primary care providers. They wouldn't have recognized that a painful lump is less worrisome and more likely to be infectious or inflammatory. Um, and uh, when we, uh, there are uh, a couple of key action statements that uh, describe specific factors about the patient's history or about the lump itself that might be worrisome. So those were um, important to um, concretely state for the primary care providers. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think the, the guideline does a very good job of that, of, of describing uh, discreetly what are the worrisome factors. Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting because we're taught a neck mass in an adult is cancer until proven otherwise. And as a head and neck surgeon, almost every neck mass I see is cancer. And it's sometimes I try to put myself uh, in the shoes of people who don't see cancer every single day. Is that statement that head and, a neck mass in an adult is cancer until proven otherwise valid? I think it is. The, the, um, the point is that if a patient has a neck mass, you do need to see if they have an infectious source. Uh, but barring that they don't have a, upper air, a respiratory tract infection, a dental infection, an ear or sinus infection, you have to explain why that mass is there. Uh, typically, infection is going to have uh, signs and symptoms where it arises. And if those aren't there, then this automatically should be considered a high-risk neck mass, along with other features, whether it's been there for two weeks or longer, whether the size is greater than 1.5 centimeters, um, these are things that uh, we want uh, primary care providers to be aware of so that we don't see delays in care because of inappropriate antibiotic use. Uh, uh, one of the papers we looked at showed that 50 to 70 percent of head and neck cancer patients with a neck mass have been treated with one or even multiple courses of antibiotics. And that ultimately delays their care, per perhaps affecting their stage of cancer and curability. Yeah, interesting. Very good point. So now let's, let's get past the point of antibiotics. We've, we've educated uh, the audience well enough to recognize that you have to be concerned and this isn't infectious. So what, what is the next major recommendation to do with, with the neck mass? So one of the things we wanted to make sure is that all patients who present with a neck mass get a thorough physical examination. And uh, the, in the case of malignancy, a lot of these tumors can be well hidden. They can hide in the tonsil area or the back of the tongue, areas that are uh, somewhat hard to, to see and evaluate. But uh, when a patient presents, these areas need to be looked at. And if they can't be sufficiently looked at by uh, that caregiver, they need to be referred to a caregiver who may have some advanced uh, instruments such as uh, flexible scopes to look at these areas to make sure that there's not a, uh, a visible tumor. Okay. One of the things that impressed me about the article, I talked about the pictures of that examination. There's a nice picture showing the scope, but also the picture of the base of tongue examination. Maybe you could talk more about that. So, so there's several components to physical exam. There's, uh, uh, you know, certainly visual inspection, but also palpation of the tissues is very important. And the figure you're uh, alluding to is one of a glove finger that's actually reaching around the back of the tongue to feel the back of the tongue. And this is a case where you know, tumors feel different than normal tissue. They're generally firmer, harder, they can be tender when touched. So um, you know, uh, that uh, should be a, a considered part of the physical exam of the head and neck patient. 
if I can add to that, um, as I recall, the discussions at the time were that we wanted to convey the idea that a thorough head and neck exam is an invasive exam. It's not something that your dentist typically does. It's not something that uh, people who have not had advanced training in the care of head and neck cancer patients, they're, they're not generally uh, trained to do that exam. So then is the goal of this guideline to get those, um, that level of practitioner to do this examination or to recognize that it should be done by somebody with more specialized training? We, we really didn't uh, explicitly state that. I mean, we feel that a, a trained uh, examination by a, a, uh, someone who's uh, trained in it and knows what they're looking for is sufficient, uh, whether that's an olaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, whether that's a oral surgeon, whether that's a general surgeon or um, a primary care doctor. But uh, we did uh, state that certain areas you're just not going to see without advanced imaging capability, including scope examination. Great. So let's, let's move on to the next step. Obviously, if we're worried about malignancy, we, we have to talk about tissue diagnosis. So what is the recommendation of the guideline on how to approach uh, tissue diagnosis? So the, the guideline wanted to address an issue that um, is unfortunate. Uh, we will, as head and neck surgeons, see a patient who has a neck mass who, that hasn't been diagnosed, uh, that goes to surgery and has that neck mass removed thinking it's a benign cyst or abscess and it turns out to be cancer. And that can lead to complications with their treatment and could even decrease their survival. So. Uh, fortunately, now uh, there is a gold standard diagnostic technique called fine needle aspiration. And we specifically looked at the data for fine needle aspiration, which is uh, overwhelmingly supported as a first line diagnostic method for uh, a persistent neck mass in the adult patient. And uh, it's a uh, procedure that's widely available. It um, is, uh, although invasive, is uh, uh, well tolerated by patients, and it can be highly accurate for diagnosis. And it doesn't delay care by having open surgery or uh, potentially having the complications of spilling tumor tissue into, uh, into a violated neck. So there's at least two scenarios that I can think of that sometimes guide people away from fine needle aspiration. The first is the suspicion that it's lymphoma and the concept that you can't diagnose lymphoma with fine needle aspiration. And the second is uh, the suspicion that you're dealing with a branchial cleft cyst and the concept that if I do a needle biopsy of the branchial cleft cyst, I'm going to cause it to be infected or inflamed, which will make the resection more complicated. So could you speak to those two scenarios that, sure. or myths, if you will, potentially? Yeah. Sure. Uh, the, there is the misperception that lymphoma cannot be diagnosed with fine needle aspiration, and that's not the case. Uh, Certainly, um, trained patho cytopathologists who also have the ability to run uh, flow cytometry on needle aspirations can make a diagnosis of lymphoma. Now, often those patients, once lymphoma is diagnosed, would need an open biopsy to show the type of lymphoma. The first step would be a fine needle aspiration for that group as well. Secondly, branchial cleft cysts just don't occur that often in adults. Um, uh, most will present in the second or third decade of life. And, you know, if you get older than that, it, it's extremely rare. So anything that looks cystic uh, should be, uh, again, considered malignant until proven otherwise. Uh, we do know that uh, HPV-related uh, head and neck cancer tends to create a cystic-looking lymph node. Uh, um, at least half the neck masses in HPV head and neck cancer patients are cystic in appearance, often arising from the tonsil or base of tongue. So you can uh, aspirate these cystic masses, uh, and there are techniques that we talk about in the guideline about sampling the, the more solid component of the cyst that will allow for appropriate diagnosis. Yeah, so I, I agree with you on both. Uh, in, usually for lymphoma, I'm generally, when I have that conversation with a referring physician or an oncologist even, I would say, Part of the purpose of the needle biopsy is to rule out the other things, recognizing that they still might need an open biopsy for the lymphoma. Uh, and for the uh, branchial cleft cyst situation, oftentimes when somebody's surprised, if you will, that it ended up being cancer, the primary was quite apparent. So it goes back to the importance of a thorough head and neck examination, because if they had noticed the tonsil mass, 
they wouldn't have thought the cystic neck mass was a branchial cleft cyst. So I think the guideline really does a good job of incorporating so many of these important points from start to finish. As head and neck surgeons, we usually receive patients who are well packaged. They have their needle biopsy, they have their imaging, they have their diagnosis, and somebody's already talked to them a little bit about that. Um, so I, we don't often get the front lines of decision making on that workup. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about the guidelines approach to imaging. On, on somebody coming in with a neck mass. When, how early, and what type? So the guideline has a statement about imaging. It's one of our strong recommendations that a patient with a neck mass um, should, um, with a neck mass that's concerning for cancer, um, should have imaging, and it should be cross-sectional imaging, preferably CT, otherwise MR, with contrast. Great. You know, we're... And when we say that, I mean, most guidelines want to state what would be your best um, imaging modality. In this case uh, of an uh, adult neck mass of unclear etiology, CT scan with contrast and or MRI with contrast would be considered the best. Now, that, uh, that might create some uh, discussion because ultrasounds are very common now. There are people who have ultrasounds in their office, in their emergency departments. But... The evidence shows that ultrasound, although very good at showing the mass itself, does not show the relationship of that mass to surrounding structures. And it also doesn't uh, evaluate areas where a potential cancer could be uh, hiding. So, for instance, a patient with a neck mass evaluated with CT, that CT may pick up a base of tongue mass or a tonsil mass as well, whereas with ultrasound, you're limited to evaluation of the mass, and it really doesn't help you diagnostically as far as where that arises from. And how, how about contrast enhancement? They need it. <laughs> so contrast enhancement is important because uh, certainly uh, that allows you to visualize the relationship of that mass to surrounding uh, structures, uh, the, the vascular system, but also it, uh, we do know tumors uh, have certain enhancement characteristics and that can also help us uh, uh, determine if something has malignant potential or not. I can build on the idea of uh, the use of ultrasound. Although uh, the guideline doesn't recommend ultrasound instead of CT or MR, um, the guideline does acknowledge the value of ultrasound um, to help uh, guide an FNA. Um, and so the guideline specifically speaks to that problem about an um, about a, uh, indeterminate or not an indeterminate, I guess it would be. The guideline speaks to the problem of um, insufficient sample from an FNA, and, and if you're having trouble getting sufficient tissue, repeating the FNA with ultrasound guidance can be very helpful. Great. Any other major recommendations that, that you'd like to bring up at this point? I, I think uh, just uh, I'm, we're hoping that people will uh, take a look at this, use this as an opportunity for education. Uh, you know, we do know that uh, the epidemiology of HPV-related head and neck cancer is only going to grow. Uh, expected to be the dominant form of head and neck cancer by the year 2030. So we're going to see a lot of cases of this. So I hope people will take the time to get familiar with this uh, method of evaluation. Uh, agreed. Uh, again, we talked about the timeliness in the HPV epidemic. Another thing with the HPV is that it's, it's changed the demographic of malignancy in adults uh, and uh, in terms of age. It's younger patients and people who haven't smoked. So for people who are not familiar with that, they're, they're even more surprised that the mass could be cancerous. So how do we help spread the word? And so this is the White Journal is an otolaryngology journal, and this will certainly go to our, our membership. But how do we get it beyond otolaryngologists? What's our mission in doing so? So um, for those of us who have been involved in the guideline, we certainly can take the message forward. I've actually already spoken to family medicine physicians about this topic because I think they're the ones on the, who will be on the front lines encountering these patients. But we do need to share it with our primary care providers. And, and that's one of the great things about a guideline panel is that we have people from such diverse backgrounds. Uh, many of these members will take this back to their own uh, societies and organizations to spread the word. Great. Well, thank you, Melissa, and thank you, Boyd, thank you. and thank you, everybody at home, for listening. Uh, hopefully you uh, enjoyed this. Uh, certainly a very important message.